It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. We've got lots of security news, including a zero-day exploit in IE9, uh, IE8, and 9. <laughs> but before, before we do that, we're going to talk to one of our favorite authors. Mark Rasinovich is here next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for Security Now is provided by the new WinApp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 370, recorded September 19th, 2012. Mark Rasinovich. Security Now is brought to you by Ford. Ford invites tech geeks to join the conversation, submit ideas, and grab your tech geek badge at social.ford.com. It's time for Security Now, the show that uh, protects you and your loved ones online and your privacy online. And uh, we've got a great show planned for you today. Let me first introduce our explainer-in-chief himself, Mr. Steve Gibson of GRC.com. Hi, Steve. Hey, Leo. Great to be with you again, as always. And before we began, I, I didn't just double-check that you've got your recorders running, but we are I am recording you. this, because if you're hearing it now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, then it <laughs> must have been recorded. So, oh, yeah, uh, according right. to time travel precedents, uh, I was going to say that's sort of a time travel <laughs> paradox set by uh, Isaac Asimov or somebody. We're 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 okay <laughs> retroactively. You know, there's that new movie, and I and I it, it to me, yeah, it, to me, it's like Paradox City. How could well, Bruce Willis? Anyway, yeah, I don't understand wh why the. I mean, I, I'm I'll, I'll see it, of course, because it's sci-fi. But the premise is that the mob. 30 years in the future, which, first of all, doesn't seem like very far for us to have developed time travel all of a sudden, and then for it to be in the hands of the mob. Yeah, that was quick. Uh, they, <laughs> that when mob, they want to those mob R&D departments work fast. <laughs> when they want to assassinate someone, they send them back into the past, into what is apparently our present. And it's like, wouldn't it just be easier to do it the old-fashioned way? Well, there's but, more room for the bodies, apparently, in the 20s. Uh, or nowadays. maybe... Part part of time travel is omniscience on the part of the feds or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's uh, interesting. I'm sure they'll explain that. But, I hope they. Come but up you would think free. Bruce would know. Well, I guess he does know. Maybe there was nothing he could do about it. That he was going to. He knows the outcome of this whole thing. Otherwise, he wouldn't be there. To, I will to, say something, <laughs> and that is that there is something compelling about time travel. It is. Stories. We love it, don't we? You yeah. know, there there's a special pack of star of all the Star Trek time travel uh, episodes th across the entire set of series. The original ones with 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 Spock and Kirk, um, then the Janeway ones. Janeway actually was getting herself in all kinds of trouble on the on Voyager, and <laughs> and you know the uh, the various ones. So well, this is the uh, uh, this is the kind of their version of the if you kill your grandfather. Uh, what happens saga only in the other direction i guess yeah, anyway well, it'll be fun but we don't we don't need well, to spend time with this <laughs> no because we have got something much better introduce your guest he's sitting someone. here he's lurking right next to you <laughs> someone much better um our listeners will know uh actually we told everybody last week so unless someone missed last week they'll know that we have a special guest this week mark rasinovich who long time security and computer insiders know from his work uh, at SysInternals, where all of us were downloading fancy utilities that were absolutely un unavailable in any form anywhere else, yeah. just like the best stuff. I, I remember every so often I'd go over and suck everything down just in case anything ever happened to the website that would cause them to become unavailable because <laughs> they were so good. They were stuff. so good. They oh, were yeah. so important. Oh, yeah. And, and then, uh, I don't know, I guess it was last year, Mark dropped me a note and said he'd written a novel. And I I said, what? Oh, uh, 
uh, he, he said, he said, I'd like to send you a copy. And I, I said, OK, now uh, I have a review of his second novel, which is the occasion of his joining us on the podcast to chat a little bit about that and how we got into this and and all that sort of the, the human interest side. But I thought I would quickly share what I wrote publicly uh, about Mark's work. Uh, I said, like so many of his terrific book book's early reviewers, I've known Mark for many years. Mark is a celebrity of significant note within the computer industry. But I only knew that Mark could write world-class code. I had no idea that he could also write world-class novels. And being artful at one certainly doesn't suggest any strong talent for the other. So being very picky... I worried when Mark sent an early copy of his first novel, Zero Day. I wanted to like it and worried that I might not. So I'll just say that I wasn't the least bit worried. I was delighted when he sent an early copy of novel number two. If you haven't yet read Zero Day, you really don't need to. But I loved that Mark took that Mark told his second story through the eyes of the two protagonists whom he introduced and developed throughout his first work of fiction. So by all means, click the purchase button above. But if you haven't already read Zero Day, why not begin at the beginning? Today, everyone understands that modern connected life requires some concern for online privacy and security. If you know very little about the details of how bad things happen to people online, you'll find Mark's stories compelling from that standpoint. They explain this clearly and intelligibly, wrapped around exciting narratives that bring those details to life. And if, on the other hand, you know your way around computer security, you'll find Mark's stories not only compelling, but also technically perfect. I'm so glad that Mark decided to share his imagination and storytelling talent with the world. Once you've read Mark's novels, I'll bet you find yourself recommending them to others as well. I certainly have. Well, that's exciting. And we should mention that Mark will be back on Windows Weekly tomorrow and probably will talk more about Windows tomorrow. <laughs> but today <laughs> we'll talk about Zero Day. Mark Rasinovich, welcome. Well, uh, and, and so... What I loved about the book, just by way of introducing it to our audience, you know, we have a special audience that have been oh, yeah. maybe listening to us for seven and a half years. We've we've covered as I as I was reading the book. I mean, everything that Mark discusses, we've done podcasts on, and we've come at it sort of from a dry technical. This is the way it works. Here's here's the technology side. And as I was reading this, I was thinking this would really be interesting for our listeners because it, the technology will be intimately familiar. But here Mark actually employs these things in a very interesting plot. And I mean, but it, it, th that's exactly real. And it gives you a chill to, to sort of see this stuff come to life the way Mark pulls it together. You're talking about his, of course, uh, wonderful book, uh, Windows Internals Part 2, now available in, <laughs> in paperback. Oh, no, you're not talking about that. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Mark. It's good to have you on uh, on Security Now. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, and thanks. Um, I, I emailed Steve when I saw that review. I'm thrilled and flattered and honored uh, that he liked the book so much and that he took the time to write a review and share that opinion with everybody else, and it's, it's great to be on the show. Well, so I guess my first question is, uh, how did this happen? What, you know, we all know you as a code smith, and now you've written two really good novels. What's the backstory? Uh, so, well, it, it really happened because I had this, I've always had this urge to write a book, uh, a novel, like many people that get involved in reading when they're young, science fiction and techno thrillers, and I've would read these stories that were so well crafted and yet built on solid technological grounding so that I'd read it and I'd feel smarter at the end. It was like I was going to school but having fun as I was reading the book and thought it'd be really fun at some point to challenge myself to construct something like that. And what pushed me to the edge of actually 
dedicating the time required to craft something was the the strong belief post 9-11 and post sequel slammer and blaster and code red that terrorists could would see cyber weapons as an ideal weapon for uh, achieving their agenda which would just be indiscriminate destruction uh, we saw with those kinds of worms that they would people would write them kids would write them in their basements let them loose just to see how fast they could spread without any real kind of uh, malicious payload really involved with them and yet they would cause so much disruption just in that form so that's what pushed me to write the book zero day was uh, what I think is a realistic threat and also one that uh, I could tell a story that was a techno thriller built on technology and share what uh, security professionals life is like and what cybersecurity is all about and the kind of risks that we, we operate with because our systems and our lives are so dependent on uh, computer systems so that's what would push me to write that and I actually finished it in mid or early 2006 it took me several years to find an agent and then a publisher and then finally get it out the door so but th that's what was the impetus and then uh, I'd started working on Trojan Horse a couple years before Zero Day, case Zero Day did well then I wanted to have uh, another one ready to go I finished it after Zero Day came out and it was kind of the, the reception to Zero Day that encouraged me to push through and, and get that one out the door and I've been working on a third one as well Whoa, whoa, wait. You just said you've been working on a third one? Yep, working on a third one. <laughs> uh, what, is that in five. between writing Windows Internals? How do you find time to do all that? Well, Windows Internals, uh, as you showed, 6th edition part two is going to be out, I think, next week. It's RTM. Microsoft Press announced that earlier this week, so it's now off to the publishers and Amazon.com to get out there. But that's my last rev of the windows internals book and that one actually finished several months ago and i've been working with dave solomon and alex Ionescu uh, with contributions from some other people so it's been kind of a low level background activity working on the book for the last few years on the windows internals book series it's funny i would have thought wow. it'd be the other way around the novel would be the you know you go home and yeah. go up to the yeah. attic and spend an hour each night working on it well actually the, the novel is that way but the novel uh, comes in more dedicated spurts than the book right, did. And the right. book, uh, you know, the book research for the Windows Internals book and some of the original writing for the book start, started many years ago around the time Windows 7 RTM as I was writing magazine articles and blog right. posts and right. researching uh, and just being familiar with what the, the product was and researching areas that I wasn't directly involved in. So that has been kind of ongoing for a long time. But the, the novel work is more, I need to dedicate serious time and sh more shorter spurts so that I don't lose my train of uh, plot and right. thinking and right. being immersed in it. Is it like programming, writing a novel? It, um, it is kind of like What you just described sounds like a programmer might say that. I don't, you know, I don't want to lose the thread of my, uh, you know, you're juggling yeah. many yeah. balls when you write a program. It is, it is totally like a program. In fact, I experienced the same kind of uh, context switching overhead, and there's a programmer term for you, when I... <laughs> Working on a system internals tool, and then I am pulled off to do other things and return to it a week or two later. It's okay. I need to get back in the, um, the mindset of what this tool is and the flow and the architecture of it to figure out how to evolve it. I, now, you have comments. Is, you have comments in source code to make that possible. What do you do in a novel? Do you have comments? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I've got notes of things that I make as I go along to keep track of where I, what, what my thoughts are and where I think things will go. Uh, things that I'd like to include. So I do have some some of that to help me get back into it, but it's still uh, it is massive context switches, and even switching between writing and coding is a big context switch. Sure, sure. Which so try well, to minimize the number of times I do that. For what it's worth, um, having read both novels, I I feel strongly that there is a an important social good that you have accomplished. Um, I mean, it really those books are technically accurate. They give anyone who is familiar with what's really going on in the security scape, I mean, a deep chill because what you paint, we understand, is is absolutely possible. And I mean, I, I really did get a sense of almost foreboding. And, and that's a useful thing to be able to give people for example, 
you know, decision makers in government who who don't really get it, don't understand what's happening because what what you've portrayed is is technically I mean, it, it is happening at, at, you know, like right now. And frankly, I'm very impressed that you wrote Zero Day six years ago because, I mean, it was contemporary last year. I mean, it was, you know, for that to have been already five years old is is impressive. You were you were looking into the future back then. Yeah. And I was actually concerned in that gap time gap that something would happen and the book would become obsolete. Uh, and wouldn't get out of <laughs> no, no to fear of that. <laughs> but you said that. Yeah, uh, I mean, we had we had we had Stuxnet happening, you know, at the same it time. Got, it got, got like, more germane. Crap. It got more topical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually did. I complained to the publisher, "What is taking so long? What you know, it's going to become obsolete." They're like, "No, it'll just become more topical." Uh, you know, they're, they're putting a positive spin on it. But absolutely, I, I think I wanted to send. Uh, a message to everybody because everybody's involved with cybersecurity. A- anybody running a small business, even in your home, you've got cybersecurity as one of one of the, the kind of uh, responsibilities for keeping your own data secure, keeping your identity secure, keeping your business up and running, keeping your customers' data secure, keeping our national infrastructure secure. And you've seen with the Cybersecurity Act of 2012 and the debates in Congress and the uh, partisan politics that we've seen going on with that. There's a lot of people that don't get it. And also, I think that there's this anti-regulatory philosophy that lots of the significant portion of our politicians have, which I think that if you look at some of the industries that we've regulated, it's hard to argue that the regulation was unnecessary and not beneficial. You look at food, for example, or water, that regulate and or the uh, financial industry, the regulations we've got there that we're not all better off because of some regulation. And yet they'll sit and argue no regulation necessary in cybersecurity. But isn't the, con- isn't the concern that the government, that uh, unlike food and water, that our governmental officials just seem to lack a basic understanding of technology. I think people are afraid that they're going to write something that uh, look at SOPA that, that makes no yeah. sense technically. Um, I think that's a, that is a concern and it's a valid concern, but I, I don't think that that's a good reason to say, well, we're not going to do anything about it and let everybody and just have it be cooperative and voluntary and let people do what they want to, especially when the nation is depending on these systems for uh, for us to continue to operate well. So we outsource so much of our critical national critical infrastructure to private industry and yet say, well, you can voluntarily have security best practices and voluntarily share information with us and voluntarily right. You know, and I just don't see that as working. It's not in their best interest to spend money on something that they view as uh, maybe low risk or, uh, well, if it's going to happen to us, well, it's going to happen to everybody. So why should I encumber myself with being the best at it? The free market, I, you know, pressures that people say will influence people to do the right thing, I don't think really are there. Now, Congress recently I- decided not to regulate, but the president a couple of days ago proposed an executive order that would add some cyber. So have you looked at his proposed executive yeah, it is, order it is pretty watered down uh, it is focused on again the voluntary sharing and voluntary adherence to cybersecurity principles right. and i it's think that enough. uh yeah i don't think it's enough and i think that one of the, the a lot of the language is vague so it's really open to interpretation but i think one of the can one of the theories about what this executive order is really aimed at is not to for the president to come out and uh, issue an executive order but rather to scare Congress back into uh, talking about a bill and getting the bill through, where which is the right way that this should happen, not just the president issuing something. So I think it's somebody's. I've read articles that people say it looks like it's potentially a bluff just to get people back at the table. Was and the I, Cybersecurity Act uh, sufficient in your mind? Was it well written, well crafted? Well, I think that the uh, original Lieberman version was. I think that the one that after McCain got his hands on it became way too watered down. And that, that one, if you look at it, is basically volunteer versus regulation. And, and I'm not saying, when I, by the way, when I say regulation, that it's just purely regulation. I think we need to have incentives to tax breaks and other ways of positive reinforcement for people doing the right thing, not just the negative side of it, too. But the, the Republican version of it is definitely, 
I think more cl it's closer to what the executive order looks like. And I think maybe that the Obama administration figured, okay, this maybe this is a first step. Let's just let's just agree, let's just establish what we can agree on, and then we can build from there, rather than just not have anything. So that's why you saw uh, Lieberman say, okay, fine, we'll, we'll go with this one, and then it still fell apart. You know, um, I guess it's as, as as a consequence of the way the internet sort of grew organically and the way computing and personal computer sort of grew organically. But I'm noticing this sort of a, I don't know, a, a, a schism between the, um, or as, as a consequence of the amount of damage that an incompetent programmer can actually do and I note, for example, by way of comparison, that attorneys and medical doctors have to get substantial additional education and then pass tests and essentially become certified. And, you know, programmers don't have anything like that. You know, like there, there's, I mean, but at the same time, it's sort of gone from a casual hobby into in, in, into something that is really um, a, a, a potent tool for for good, but if if code is written incorrectly, sloppily, casually, um, a lot of damage can be done. And of course, all the license agreements say that there's no responsibility on the part of the producer of the software, which is another odd aspect to this computer industry that has persisted from the beginning. You know, what, what, what do you think about the idea? I mean, not that I'm wanting to impose regulations and, and, and you know, the same sort of, you know, MD degree and, and law degree on people, but something, it, it feels to me like, like somehow we need something to begin to tighten down the quality of the software being produced because it's become it's gone from not really mattering much to being you know national security and and nation state level yeah and i i think you're absolutely right uh one of the one of the things we do at microsoft is people have to go to sdl training software development lifecycle training which includes the threat modeling aspect of it uh how not not just uh, the threat modeling, but then what kind of tools we have available to us to make sure that the code is more secure. The tools that flag improper use of variables and uh, you know uninitialized variables, and then how you uh, the defense and depth things that we apply to our software. The we and Microsoft tries to help the industry in general by publishing SDL training publicly, and there's a number of companies adopt it. It would be great to see that at least starting with people that are developing the systems that that are at the heart of things like our electrical grid, uh, our communication systems, that those people would have to have some certification in SDL and maybe and probably have it renewed every year or two years as well, just to make sure that they are at least aware uh, that this is a, a way to look at their software to make sure that it's more secure and more resilient to attack. I think I totally agree with you. Um, where would you, where would you, you, you sort of touched on this before, but I'm wondering where you, where would you split the responsibility for the trouble that we're seeing between the technology suppliers and the technology consumers? That is, you know, how much of the responsibility is on the software authors and, you know, don't users have some responsibility for for their own conduct? I, I think I would put, yeah, it's, it's hard to put the blame on the consumer because the consumer as, assumes, right, when they buy software that the, it's being developed properly and it's not going to have uh, flaws with it. Uh, so I, I find it hard to put that, the burden on them. And, but I also find it hard to put the burden on the software provider in that scenario too because they're sitting in a market where uh, it's one of those, There's I've got certain competitors. If I spend too much time and energy on this stuff, 
I could fall behind on features and being competitive. And so, so what if it's secure if people aren't buying it because the company next door has all the cool whiz bang features everybody wants, even if it's insecure. And right. those guys are playing this risk management kind of situation while it's unlikely to really come back and slam us in the face. And so I, if you look at what the government does, they've got this program called FISMA, which is now evolved the FedRAMP, where they'll say, we do have uh, certain requirements for the software that is going to, that we're going to deploy our applications onto and run government workloads on top of that include things like making sure that you have two-factor authentication for your administrators and a whole, a whole number of other things that that uh, don't go as deep as the software developed using software security development lifecycle, but at least hitting some of the outside, very visible aspects of having a secure environment. In that case, the it's the consumer in the government's case, which has leverage, which is the money and the dollars required that they're willing to spend on buying these solutions. Uh, so unless we had all consumers be that way and have uh, a certification and auditing, which the government has, then I, I don't see a way to change that dynamic between the consumers and publishers of software that people are using, like in the dentist office. Yeah. So, so I guess there will, from what, what we can see, always be a, a, a tension between the suppliers and the consumers, and, but also a tension within the developer side between, you know, new and features and, and spending more time on security, but, you know, not having as many features. People, you know, people talk about a, you know, how nice it would be to have a closed system, which could inherently be more secure. The problem is, though, then they want, oh, but I need this and this and this. And so suddenly, you know, they push it away from being closed. And as soon as you do that, you open it up to exploitation. Yeah. And we're seeing, actually, uh, as we move to the cloud and we've got all these startups, Agile software development, fling it out as fast as you can. And you know that, that you're sacrificing something there, yeah. which if it's good enough to run for now, we'll move on to the next thing. But uh, at some point, it becomes a house of cards that you're playing with. So, yeah, I don't I don't see a good way out of that dynamic without uh, the le- kind of levers that, that governments put in place that really cares. And, uh, you know, it's like paying taxes or eating broccoli. That's what security boils down to. It's or paying insurance, right? So unless you really believe that you're going to, that it's, that you're at risk of something bad happening, you're just not going to pay that, that price. Well, it's, for example, the, the, you know, we advise people not to use the same password across multiple websites. And that's now becoming sort of standard, you know, if you really want the best security, this is what you need to do. But wow, you know, that's much more difficult to manage and maintain over time than saying, oh, you know, I don't I'm not going to worry about that. I want the convenience of just using one password everywhere. So, again, that it's, it's exactly that kind of a, a, a trade off of convenience versus security. Yeah. And it's very few people are, make, are making that trade off right now with passwords, despite the fact you see these huge password breaches that. But from one account service that enables the attackers to get into a whole bunch of others uh, related ones that still not stopping people from doing that risk calculation. Oh, it's, it's unlikely to happen to me. So I'm just going to continue operating the way I am and cross my fingers. Right. Uh, the other thing too, uh, I wanted to point out about the, this regulation aspect and the, some of the arguments that McCain will make and some of the people against regulation and even government incentives for being secure is they'll, they'll say the free market will take care of it because if there is a problem, then there'll be a lawsuit. And that's the way that the free market will fix it. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to bank our national security and infrastructure on, well, if it falls apart, well, then we'll sue the people that created the, the holes. Because it's by then it's too late. You've already the damage is is already done. You're not going to recoup or fix things by with a lawsuit and, and putting the company out of business after the fact. Yeah. So okay. So here's a big, wide open question that I think our listeners would find interesting, which is from your perspective, 
and this is completely wide open, what major trends of any kind do you perceive like in the way the industry's moving, the way security's changing, the way attitudes are changing, uh, development is changing, sort of what's, where are things going? Well, the, the bigger trends, I think we're right in the middle of the third disruption in the computer industry, the first one being the mainframes, the second one being client server, and this one being cloud and mobile. So that's one that's affecting everybody in the way that everybody thinks about software, from enterprise developers to ISVs to consumers. But underneath that, as far as security goes, I think that what we're seeing, and I've been a proponent of this form of security, the security me technique, the security mechanism, since uh, shortly after 2000, when I started to really focus on what my software company, Winternals at the time, could do from a security perspective, and that is whitelisting. Back then, whitelisting was uh, something that nobody used. There were Windows and Unix had some whitelisting capabilities, but very, very few people used it. And it, that's been the case up until very recently. And we, people, I don't, I don't think, are really aware of this, but now whitelisting has become one of the key security features of the modern client platforms. When you look at iOS, for example, Apple's ecosystem, it's a complete whitelisted ecosystem. The whitelist, you, you can only run the software on the phones that have been approved by Apple and curated by Apple. Apple is essentially creating their whitelist in their app store. And that has made those platforms, Android's got one, it's not as well curated, so we've seen a problem with that. And then Windows Phone's got a, a curated whitelist as well, and Windows 8 does too, that those, those whitelists, you see the dramatic impact on the security of the system by having that, that whitelisting in place. Even if there is, and, and the sandboxing that goes with the whitelisting as well. So I think uh, I feel somewhat vindicated because I've always believed whitelisting would come back and become one of the primary tools in a cybersecurity posture or, or platform. And we're seeing that with the client platforms really adopting it and, and, that, and seeing the dramatic effects of that being in place. And that, that's really interesting too because it does parallel the same kind of evolution that we've seen elsewhere. Um, we've talked several times on the podcast about how the very first deployments of firewalls were default open and blocking only specific things that were known not to be, uh, not to want to be made public. And it took a while, but we finally reversed that model in firewalls where it's default block and then you selectively open availability for those services that you do want to allow through. And it was only after making that switch, although it's, you know, arguably more difficult, you're going to, you're going to perhaps false block when you don't intend to, but that's better than having, you know, everything open by default and blocking only the things you know you want to prevent. Yeah, no, that's a great parallel there, and um, I, we've we see the, the the mirror of that in uh, cybersecurity too, with the blacklisting approach of anti malware, and just what I think is argued uh, hard to argue not being a, a complete failure. I mean, the the fact is when I give a, a talk on security and system internal tools for troubleshooting security. I have a fake piece of malware, which it's a piece of malware that I created, and it is malicious in the sense that it's a demo piece of malware, but it is completely unknown to the yep. blacklisting anti-malware solutions. Now, if I tried to deploy that in a system that was employing whitelisting, it would be totally ineffective. It would get blocked. And very similar to what you were talking about with firewalls, where for a long time we op operated with a blacklist approach with firewalls and then switched over to whitelisting and realized that was much more effective. I think the same thing is happening with uh, anti-malware. The places where it hasn't caught up are on desktop systems and even server environments. I don't, whitelisting is not mandatory, mandated as part of uh, FedRAMP and I believe it should be. Or as far as software that's operating our nation, national critical infrastructure, there should be uh, policies in place for what software is running on those systems and stopping any other software from operating on those systems. And that would go a long way to making, to keeping those systems more secure. Yep. Yep. 
Well, I so you ha- go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. So, please. No, I was just going to say. So you, I uh, was just going to wrap up by saying. So you do have a third novel to tease us with at some point in yeah, the future. I do. I do. It's called. It's. You know, I've been working on it, and it's called Rogue Code. It is. See, if you look at the first book, the theme was cyber terrorism. The theme of the of Trojan Horse was state-sponsored cyber espionage and the and spear phishing. And the, the theme of this third one is insider threats and social engineering, <laughs> which <laughs> good, I think good. if there's any weak spot in any sy- system, you yes. can have the best technological defenses in place. But if you have an insider, a malicious insider, that is uh, very hard to defend against. And social engineering, of course, uh, a slightly weaker form of the same thing as an insider threat, but also extremely hard to, to defend against. Very cool. Well, Mark, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Lou uh, uh, M.M., who is in our chat room, and I guess a colleague of yours is going to run over with a PR for, Ohio PR40 microphone for you to borrow <laughs> for tomorrow. I think he's already linked you. <laughs> but it, really great to have you, and uh, I appreciate uh, you. Boy, we, we've been fans since, since the Sys Internals days. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, thank you so much for all your contributions through the years yeah. to be able to have those tools and they, they, they did not disappear when Microsoft Thank sent you goodness. up. I remember when yeah. that happened, everyone was like, oh my God, we're going to lose this internals. No, they, you know, Microsoft's got Mark now. And it's like, you know, they're still around and they're getting better all the time. Yep, business as usual. Still, still, that's my other hobby is the sys internals tools. Still Great. working on those. Great. But thanks for having me on the show. It's been fun. Nice to meet you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Yeah, nice to meet you, Leo. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 Mark Rusinovich. Uh, Rusinovich.com, R-U-S-S-I-N-O-V-I-C-H.com. And then Sys Internals is still on the Microsoft.com uh, site if you just Google Microsoft Sys Internals. Those and people are, can... I should have them. asked him if he's updating. We'll ask tomorrow if he's updating them because I think... I don't know if there's a Windows 8 version. I remember looking at... Um one of them not long ago, I needed something, and it was there, and it was current. It was Good. at least Windows Seven current, Good. and it was like, oh, thank goodness, this stuff is still around. So, yeah, yes, just sir. you yeah. know, yeah. some yeah. of the best tools there are. Yeah, part two tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a break. Come back with more Steve Gibson and security news. Yep, we had a very very busy week. This was nominally. A Q and A week, right? But I, I thought with Mark and with so much news to talk about, uh, once again we just don't have a chance to get to questions. So I did download two hundred and eighty nine pieces of email uh, this morning. But uh, you have another week to send more stuff in to uh, grc.com slash feedback, and we will do that next week. Today Good. or af- uh, a- after. Uh, for the second half of this podcast, we'll catch up on the week's news because there was a lot that happened. Excellent. We're brought to you today, of course, by our friends at Ford who invite you to visit their uh, new site just for Ford owners and prospective Ford owners, social.ford.com. And there's a lot on there. They just announced, I'm very excited, the new fusions for 2013, including we've been talking about that plug-in hybrid, the all-electric fusion and, of course, the hybrid fusion. You can find out more at social.ford.com. Uh, the uh, fusion hybrid gets 47 miles per gallon combined and highway and city, uh, which I think makes it the number one um, hybrid on the market. It just it, uh, It's uh, really impressive that they're able to get equivalent city and highway mileage. Read more about that, uh, about the EcoBoost engines. You can you can get a V8. Oh, oh sweet. And uh, Ford trucks and everything Ford at social.ford.com, including an article I wrote. I had an interview, uh, oh, it's been a month, I think, now ago with Jim Buchkowski, who's a lead technologist at Ford. And uh, I wrote up some notes from the uh, conversation. Really interesting guy talking about the future of the Ford API, Ford apps, autonomous vehicles and more you'll find that if if you go to the uh, articles section on social.ford.com and read the uh, technologies pages it's in there you'll see my smiling face somewhere in there it's kind of fallen now down to the bot there it is uh what else can you do there well you can share your ideas and read other people's ideas it's kind of a 
digital suggestion box. You can even vote on the ideas as you read them, which is fantastic. Uh, and Ford responds too, which is great. They're really participating here, posting images of your of your car. Wow, that could be my my Mustang. Oh man, videos too. Interviews and more. We got to post some of our uh, video, videos. We've got some great interviews with Ford folks uh, over the years, including several interviews with the CEO, Alan Mulally. And of course, as all social sites, they've got badges. I don't know what the point is, but they do. They have them. And you can pick a badge and pass it on. I particularly like the Tech Geek badge. You're not just ahead of the curve, you're the one leading it. There's lots of great badges for all sorts of Ford owners and future Ford owners. What was it, a pet badge? I like that. Like to take your pets wherever you go? That's Ozzy with his ears flapping. <laughs> Social.ford.com. And when you're there, find out more about the brand new Ford Fusions, the 2013s. They're coming out. And the 2013 Focus and the 2013 Escape. My goodness, this is going to be a great fall for Ford lovers. Social.ford.com. We thank them for their support of security now and steve gibson's efforts they were talking about the security of the uh, computers um where did i see that in uh, in the ford vehicles they paid a lot of attention oh. to separating the the uh the car computer with from the from the sink and all of that very interesting stuff very aware of the issues there yeah actually we have a couple there's been some uh, activity in the crime rings over in Europe with BMWs as a consequence of their keyless entry stuff, which we will talk about. I did find I ran across a really neat note from um, uh, someone named Philip Cook that I just wanted to briefly share. Uh, I, he had a success, not surprisingly, I guess, with Spinrite. Uh, he said a week ago, I started my day with a blue screen of death advising that I had an unmountable boot volume. Ugh. Efforts by Adele Tech only led him to the conclusion that we should reformat the drive and lose all my data. Nothing would recognize the drive, and all of the check disk commands in the book could not even see it or result in anything but the same blue screen on every reboot. A Mac Store utility that I ran from a downloaded file advised me to return the drive for replacement. After getting estimates ranging from $400 to $2,700, oh. which, you know, is unfortunately it's typical because they often, you know, it's like a manual process to do this, uh, to recover my data and trying numerous other tricks recommended by online chats, etc. I was fortunate to come across Spinrite. At first, the glowing testimonials seemed just too good to be true. And I will admit that I thought they may have even been fake. So I invested the $89, downloaded the file, and fired it up. At first, I thought that it was going nowhere, because after four hours, it still said 2% complete. I figured I would leave it running over the weekend, and imagine my surprise when I came back this morning, saw the message that it had completed. It booted up, ran check disk, and then started Windows. All I can say is wow. Thanks you thanks thank you for taking the time to create this program. It's bad enough losing data, but I also saved the hours it would have taken to recreate my desktop links, etc. Needless to say, I am impressed. Philip Cook. Yay. So, yay. Thank you for sharing that, Philip, with me and our listeners. Mm -hmm. So okay. Well, uh Mark is not involved. In IE security. <laughs> That's an important uh, thing to say right up front. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, there is a serious, all a buzz this week is a, I mean, Microsoft warning, you know, sending out emails warning about a new zero day IE exploit that was found in the wild. It was discovered by a researcher monitoring some servers that were known to be used by bad guys. He discovered this on Friday, and it has since been found in the wild. The Rapid7 guys who manage the Metasploit framework have, you know, they dove in over the weekend and have already updated Metasploit to demonstrate this. Microsoft has no really good answer at this point. This affects all versions of IE 
that are current, that is to say, not Windows 8 and IE 10, but Windows, but IE 9 and earlier across all versions. Apparently, the exploit that's in use now is um, is aimed at I is aimed at XP. But there's nothing that prevents it from being used on Vista and Seven. And in fact, exploits have been developed. I think the Metasploit framework um, instance is is even more effective than the one that's out in the wild. So what the one in the wild is doing is installing the poison ivy trojan that we've talked about many times, the so-called rat, the, the uh, remote I like the name. Uh, uh, takeover uh, trojan. Now, Microsoft's only response has been uh, they're not telling people to switch to Chrome. They really can't say that. Um, <laughs> that would be a good answer. <laughs> hey, you know, you might just want to use Chrome for the time uh, just, being. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're telling people to install Emmet, E-M-E-T, the Enhanced Migration Experience Toolkit. The problem is that's not always effective either, and it can be it can represent problems in uh, corporate settings um, and in the enterprise where it conflicts with other things. So everyone's sort of holding their breath. I mean, the real, the real uh, solution for our listeners has probably already been taken, which is no one is using IE for their main surfing all the time anymore. They're using it periodically when necessary to run windows update if they're you know if, if they're running windows update through their browser or only when necessary hopefully people have already taken the advice microsoft can't give and switch to firefox or chrome um, and then you don't have this problem um, this is enough of a problem and this next second tuesday of october is far enough away that is the ninth that we're, I mean, Microsoft did react to this immediately. I was impressed with how quickly they were on the ball with this when you consider this was only discovered on Friday and I, I was getting mail Monday morning two days ago saying, uh, we, there's a problem. Unfortunately, we don't really have a good solution. Um, so October 9th is, is their next opportunity for their regularly scheduled in-band update um, I don't know if they can be ready in time. Uh, maybe they'll be ready sooner. So we'll see. But uh, if uh, the, really the only thing you can do is stay away from IE or um, I guess you can, uh, you, you, you can crank the security all the way up so that IE won't run scripting. That is one of Microsoft's recommended you know mitigation measures. Of course, you we know that do it any, of, use it anyway, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. increasingly... Um, things don't work on the net. In fact, you can't even do Windows Update if you follow Microsoft's advice for making IE secure because yeah. it requires an ActiveX control and scripting in order to work. So just don't use IE. You know, that's just, it's got to be even your... Even IE8, even IE9, even yes. IE10, even... Yes. <laughs> no, no, not, not 10. 10. 10's not out yet, so... 10's not out and, and Windows 8 is not out and it is not... The, the betas are, are not, not vulnerable. vulnerable. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, that's good news. So... Whatever this is, and there's no, there are very little details. I've not bothered to go, you know, this is the exploit du jour, so I, I can't spend yeah. much time I mean, come figuring on. out. Who, nobody who has time can't. to read about all the flaws in, in, in Internet Explorer. It's, <laughs> it's be a full-time job. <laughs> now, uh, LastPass has just added a an interesting service. Um, they call it the LastPass Sentry service, which is... Interestingly enough, opt out for all LastPass users who are at the at the the paid level, either premium or enterprise users. So if you're just using the LastPass completely free, this is not available. But if you're a LastPass premium, if you've given LastPass some money and, and are a premium user, then then what LastPass is doing for you. And by opt out, I mean that you're in now, unless you tell them you explicitly don't want this, is they've made a deal with a, a, a group called Pwned List, P-W-N-E-D-L-I-S-T, that are, this Pwned List group are aggregating 
all of the publicly leaked usernames and passwords. They currently have a list of 24 million of these. And so what LastPass is doing is making a daily check of their of their paid LastPass users account email addresses against this master list. And LastPass will proactively notify any of their paid premium and enterprise users if at, if at any point their LastPass account email appears in the pwned list, which is very cool. Um, they have interesting future plans because, of course, the first thing I thought was, well, that's nice, except here we've recently been telling people don't use one email address for everything because we know that that could be a problem. And that, that was essentially what, what bit um, Honan um, with his problems. So many of us have deliberately custom or differing email addresses. And, but that's not our LastPass account email. In fact, we may explicitly have for security, a, you know, the high value email is different than others. So we, we would like to know if those are leaking. Well, they say that, and I, uh, um, they say that they're working toward providing local verification of users' entire database of LastPass data against public leakage. To do that, that would mean that there would be an agent which was added to the LastPass scripting, the Java scripting, which is running in our local browser since, um, and I, mean, I haven't thought this all the way through, um, they would be, I mean, I guess they could, they could hash everything and send hashes up and then check that. Or our own machines could be checking against a list through a service that they provide, which is what I'm guessing they would do, is they would, they would take all of the email addresses that they see, um, well, email addresses and, and usernames that, they, that we have in our locally stored LastPass in-browser database, protect that so that our security is preserved, um, and then presumably they would provide an API in their servers that allowed our browsers to check those in a secure way against this master pwned list. So it wouldn't be just our LastPass master account that was being checked, but all of the email addresses and usernames that, that we use with LastPass. So that's very cool. Oh, and they're also saying that they're working, uh, their plans are, uh, in at some point to work toward increasing the frequency so that it's much more frequent than once a day, more towards something closer to real time. Wow. So that's neat. very neat. Yeah. Now, Symantec, th this really, this comes perfectly on the heels of what Mark was talking about with his novels. Um, and, you know, He's off the line now, so I, I'll just say to our users again, I mean to our listeners, um, they're really good books. I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine anything more interesting to the listenership of security now than, than what Mark wrote because it is everything we have talked about set in a here's – the way this stuff would be applied and how it, you know, and, and I mean, and how it escapes detection. And it, it's really neat. I, as I was reading uh, book number two, Trojan Horse, I was thinking, wow, this is just so perfect for our, the, the, our podcast listeners. So uh, it, it's really, it, it's fun. Um, but speaking of nation state scale stuff, which is clearly one of, you know, the, the, the focuses Mark has had from his perspective. Symantec just produced a 14-page paper, which I, I posted a link uh, in my Twitter feed yesterday. And we are now, I, I've got this in my in the show notes. And Leo, we've got, you have a person who is posting the show notes somewhere. Is this, I, I've never On the wiki, wiki.twit.tv. 
Okay. Every show, theoretically, <laughs> on the wiki, has uh, show notes. But it's all volunteer. And so um, I had been posting stuff up there. I've given him all the notes for the past year's worth of episodes. And I think he's getting them all up there bit by bit. So I'm very grateful to our volunteers. Well, I did have a number of people or maybe one person multiple times. <laughs> Probably <laughs> that. Me, yeah. Uh, asking. He couldn't find some, some stuff that I had referred to in the last week or two. So I, I do want to explain that, you know, I produce uh, notes with links to everything in them. And, and we're now, uh, since, since Leo's got a neat volunteer who's going to be moving those into the wiki, um, I, I would recommend to everyone take a look at the, at the uh, Twit Wiki in order to to find these, but also my Twitter feed has it in this case. Anyway, it's a fourteen. He's still page catching piece. up, I think. So it looks like he's <laughs> he's got quite a ways to go still. So. <laughs> Maybe he could start on the most recent ones and work backwards. Um, if that makes sense. Right. Anyway. I will suggest that. I don't know where no, he's but- putting them now that I look. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, all right. So we'll see what's going on. Okay, so this is gripping, and I, again, I, I, I tweeted it because it's a fanta- another fantastic sort of real world, bring this down to reality look at what's going on. And Leo, I think on page nine, if you want to put that on screen, there is an amazing graph that Semantic has pulled together. Um, I'll just read their overview because it gives you sort of a chilling sense of, of what is actually going on. And this is not a Mark Rosinovich novel, though it is just like one. They said in 2009, we saw the start of high profile attacks by a group using the Hydrac. And then they said they said Perens Aurora. And we remember Aurora being referred to as what was I think it was the Google attacks um, and maybe the RSA attacks were the, uh, the Aurora Trojan horse. Symantec has monitored this group's activities for the last three years as they have consistently targeted a number of industries. Interesting highlights in their method of operations include the use of seemingly an unlimited number of zero-day exploits. Attacks on supply chain manufacturers who service the target organization, and a shift to watering hole attacks. Now, this is the first time I'd seen that term. You know, we've talked about phishing attacks where someone send, you know, it's like spear phishing where you, you know who you want to compromise, so you send them emails containing links or documents which will lead, directly lead to their, to their machine being taken over. A watering hole attack is semantics term, and I think it's going to be it's going to catch on because it's a great term, where you know who you're trying to target, but rather than going after them, you you are able to anticipate the websites they are likely to visit, like a that wildebeest is, which returns again and again to the exactly. watering hole on the desert veldt. Exactly. So the so the predator lays in wait at the watering hole and and attacks at that point. So they say uh, the watering hole attacks compromising certain websites likely to be visited by the target organization. The targeted industry sectors include, but are not restricted to defense, various defense supply chain manufacturers, human rights and non-government organizations, NGOs, and IT service providers. These attackers are systematic and reuse components of an infrastructure we have termed the Elderwood platform. The name Elderwood comes from a source code variable used by the attackers. This attack platform enables them to quickly deploy zero-day exploits. Attacks are deployed through spear phishing emails and also increasingly through web injections in watering hole attacks. Although there are other attackers utilizing zero-day exploits, for example, the Skype Pot or Nitro or even Stuxnet, we have seen no other group use so many. The number of zero-day exploits used indicates access 
to a high level of technical capability. There are just, he, uh, they, they say here, are just some of the most recent exploits they have used. Then Symantec enumerates four that we've talked about over time. Uh, Adobe Flash Player object type confusion, remote code execution vulnerability, Microsoft IE same day ID property remote code execution vulnerability, Microsoft XML core services. Remember when that was happening a few months back, and Adobe Flash Player <laughs> generic remote code execution vulnerability. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> how how uh, can we count them all? Oh God! Uh, it says <laughs> in order. In order to discover these vulnerabilities, a large undertaking would be required by the attackers to thoroughly reverse engineer the compiled applications. This effort would be substantially reduced if they had access to source code. The vulnerabilities are used as needed, often within close succession of each other, if exposure of any of the vulnerabilities is imminent. The scale of the attacks in terms of the number of victims and the durations of the attacks are another indication of the resources available to the attackers. Victims are attacked not for petty crime or theft, but for the wholesale gathering of intelligence and intellectual property. The resources required to identify and acquire useful information, let alone analyze that information, could only be provided by a large criminal organization, attackers supported by a nation state or a nation state itself. So in this 14-page report, which, again, I, I recommend our listeners uh, take a look at. I think anyone would find it interesting. Symantec details the, the, the structure that they have they have tracked down over three years and and how the the specifics of the of the attacks which might look disparate on the surface you might not easily note that these things are connected they've found the connections and built a connectivity graph showing how all of these pieces spread over the years are associated with each other and they're, they've also noted, based on the, the time, the, the, the windows during which the attacks were deployed, when the zero-day vulnerabilities were found, and, and when backtracking from the next attacks backwards, what they've been able to deduce is that shortly after a zero-day zero vulnerability is discovered – and patched, the entire platform immediately deploys the next one, as if they have an inventory of these things. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Yes. I mean, so, so, I mean, you know, here we are from our perspective, you know, talking about, okay, what happened this week and what happened last week? It all just sort of seems like, you know, salt coming out of the shaker, bouncing around chaotically without, without any c connection. But... It, but at least in this case, Symantec, by, by looking carefully at these and noticing things like common variable names and common deployments, they've got, they've got a shockwave flash file, which they, they appear to be automated systems in place for, for, for like compiling exploits into this shockwave, this generic shockwave flash package that allows them to quickly and, and again this is all about windows of opportunity we we you know we understand that there are moving targets that 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 there are people looking for m malicious connections and malware so th it's all about time how quickly can you you know get in and suck things out before the window is closed before you're discovered and you then need to come at it in a different direction. And interestingly, some of their advice for, for example, defense contractors is you really need to look at your suppliers because what they're seeing is they're, they're, they're seeing that they one or two steps away suppliers who have relationships with the, the contractors they're actually targeting 
the the suppliers who presumably have somewhat less stringent networking security, um, maybe you know sloppier management of their own websites and so forth, they represent points of entry that, that in into the network that then allows them to piggyback in on the relationship the supplier has with the contractor. I mean, and, and this this sounds like science fiction, but it there's a map of this in this PDF. So it's just, I mean, this is going on. And so, um, you know, there is reference to China. This does sound like a, a nation state that has a, a formal program assembled. And what's bizarre is this is a chunk of Mark's book, even though. Oh, really? Oh, how interesting. This was just published. Yeah, I mean, again, and, and, oh, and I, I read this three months ago in his book, and I'm, I, I'll, I'll say again, I am amazed that he put together Zero Day in 06 because, you know, Stuxnet was happening just a couple of years ago. Yeah. You know, that's like, whoa, okay, which, which really He says, didn't have prior knowledge, I don't think, right? But it just, uh, it was, you think? I, no, I, no, 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 I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that he just that, he just saw it coming. Well, and and you've heard me do the same thing, right? If you if you understand the technology, you know what's going to happen. I mean, you you can just say, okay, this is going to happen, and yeah. you know, I, I, there have been a number of times when that has come true, and so so you know, he gets it too. He he understands the technology. He realizes where the weaknesses are, and you know, and and I thought he did a good job of sort of characterizing the at the legislative level the tension that exists. You know, the the shuttle software in the U.S. shuttle program had to be absolutely bug free, and we can do that at an incredible expense. Software that's being produced commercially, eh, you know. It can get updated. Well, there, fix it the, in post. Yeah the, yeah, the 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 cost of making it perfect it goes exponential. You, you know, you hit this the hockey stick, where where to make it incrementally better, you got to spend amazingly more money. You will get something for it, but is it worth it? And and then there's of course time, there's ever present time pressure and you know competition who you know eat your lunch because they're producing sloppy code faster yours is better but you know they're getting the sales that you're not so it's not a perfect world um, anyway I'd really if if somebody wants to to have you know charts and graphs and and numbers. Rather than generalities, Symantec has put together, you know, an amazing piece of work. Oh, it looks like it's on um, – it's figure six on page seven, Leo, is a, is a graph, you know, of what they have actually found of the way all of this ties together. Um, and they put together a beautiful paper. So I wanted to, to recommend it to people. Speaking of foreseeable problems um, – for the last couple of months, BMW has had trouble. Uh, the register.co.uk, you know, in their typical inflammatory but uh, but factual fashion, uh, they had a um, a post recently titled "Got a BMW? Thicko thieves can easily nick it with a thirty dollar box." And they said BMWs and other high-end cars are being stolen by unskilled criminals using a $30 tool developed by hackers to pwn the onboard security systems. The new tool is capable of reprogramming a blank key and allows non-techie car thieves to steal a vehicle within two or three minutes or less. Onboard Diagnostics, OBD, which is a term, an acronym we're going to be hearing in the future, bypass tools, onboard diagnostics bypass tools are being shipped from China and Eastern Europe in kit form with instructions and blank keys, says a news report linking the release of the tool to a spike in car thefts in Australia, Europe and elsewhere during 2012. 
would-be car thieves need to grab the transmission between a valid key fob and a car before reprogramming a blank key, which can then be used to either open the car or start it via the OBD system. Okay, now that's one instance. There's a different one, which is unrelated, well, it's what's related, but not identical. Back in July, Motor Authority magazine um, carried a story. They said, it's every car owner's worst nightmare. You wake in the morning, grab your keys, and head to the parking lot, only to find that your car is no longer there. While new technologies such, such as chipped ignition keys and near-field communications, key fobs, have made cars more theft-resistant, they haven't made cars theft-proof. In fact, as Piston Heads points out, European fair trade rules have opened a back door of sorts for car thieves, one that allows them to create their own NFC fob to steal a car. We're not experts, and if we were, we wouldn't publish the info online. But it appears that all thieves need to snatch your ride is a diagnostic device that also reprograms blank NFC fobs. Break into a car via conventional means, access the diagnostic port, which is typically located under the steering column, and you can program a new blank key in a matter of minutes. And this works on BMWs right now. While BMWs seem to have the highest incident, incidence of theft via this method, models from Opel, Renault, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Toyota, and Porsche are also reportedly susceptible to fob cloning theft. While Britain's Society of Motor Manufacturers is working to make access to key reprogrammers more difficult, doing so may conflict with EU's competition rules, which allow independent facilities to access all data available through onboard diagnostic ports. Okay, so that was July. So our update of September is... They said in July, we brought you news that car thieves, in Great Britain anyway, had gone high tech, stealing new cars via the use of NFC key reprogramming devices. Instead of relying on old fashioned tech methods to steal certain new cars, today's thieves just need access to the car's diagnostic port, a blank NFC key and a key reprogrammer. BMW models built between 2007 and September of, two, of 2011, are the cars of choice for these thieves. And the Bavarian automaker has just announced a software fix that will eliminate the chance of NFC key theft on X5 and X6 models. Per Auto Express, BMW dealers in Great Britain will upload the revised software to owners of affected vehicles at no charge. Well, isn't that nice? While that <laughs> solves the your, your car's gone. <laughs> by, by the way, uh, <laughs> Which, we have an update for you. If you can find your, if you can find find your, your car, car, we'll happily yeah. give it to you. No oh, charge. Boy. Oh, boy. While that solves the problem for owners of X5 and X6 models, it won't do anything to resolve the issue on, on, on other BMWs. The company advises that a software upgrade is in the works for its other products and is expected to be ready within the next eight weeks. In the interim, BMW is advising owners to park their cars in a locked garage or under the watchful eye of closed circuit cameras. And, and then in a sort of a strange, yeah, well, this would happen note, they said, even after the software updates are installed, expect to see a high number of break-ins of BMW vehicles. Why? Since the modification is transparent, oh. thieves won't know won't which know. cars yeah. have been updated and which ones haven't. Right. In other you words, put a sign in the window. <laughs> I've got the new firmware. Move on. <laughs> in other words, even after the fix... BMW models will still be seen as targets of opportunity, so park appropriately. Oh now, 
I have a link in the notes. I'm not, I'm not going to dig deep into, but it is very disturbing about the onboard diagnostics. This was a presentation that Rob Vandenbrink gave to a SANS group, a SANS security presentation uh, at SANS Fire 2012. Um, the, it turns out that there is a set of, of standards, international standards for the networking technology that is across all cars. It is a, a CSMA CD, the standard sort of Ethernet, Ethernet uh, carrier sense multiple access collision detection, which there are lots of tools for. It uses a serial protocol at, I think it's like 115 k baud, but it's open. It's documented. You can give it commands. It tells you whatever you ask it, and it's ubiquitous. So, you know, when I when when I hear you say, Leo, that Ford is, you know, do, is really, really, really <laughs> taking this seriously, I'm I'm glad. Yeah. And I have said to people, I'm glad I have an older Beamer that doesn't have any of this stuff in it because I don't want it. Not probably ever. But, you know, that's just. It's a better way to, to operate. I, I, you know, we're we're gonna, you know, apparently we're gonna learn these lessons all over again. So, I mean, like for example, it's mandated that all new cars have to have tire pressure transmitting sensor systems, and that's RF, and that that's a way into these systems because people that have have engineered them haven't been willing to spend a lot of time and they've been in a hurry and, you know, same old routine again on our cars, which are becoming, you know, rolling networks, essentially, of, of small computers. So uh, I have a feeling we'll be talking about these things in the future. And I'm, I'm glad Ford mm -hmm. uh, is really taking it seriously. Uh, in a surprising development, Google has added the DNT technology to the latest developer build. Do not track will be in Google's Chrome browser by year's end. Uh, Google's spokesman Rob Shilkin said that the Obama administration had asked the entire industry to adopt the do not track technology and Google was complying with that request and the consensus that arose around it. There was sort of a, I kind of got this sense reading the whole thing of, you know, they weren't that happy about it, but, you know, they were the last browser without it. So they decided, okay, we'll, we'll put this in and let our users decide. Um, okay, a bunch of people tweeted this and we'll have details probably next week. You remember, Leo, a couple years ago, that there were two hackers, one of whom was on the beach uh, in Indonesia um, communicating with a friend of his. Uh, we, were, we were think we were imagining him, you know, sipping on uh, um, umbrella drinks uh, while he was reading the TLS CBC <laughs> yeah. uh, RFC document. I, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> that was Giuliano Rizzo on the beach. And his uh, partner, uh, Tai Dong, they're back. They were the people who figured out Beast, B-E-A-S-T, which was the browser exploit against SSL and TLS. That was a, a man-in-the-middle attack, which they crafted by taking advantage of a weakness in the cipher block chaining which is CBC, employed in SSL uh, in order to, to crack into secure connections. So uh, <clears throat> they now have a new attack called CRIME, C-R-I-M-E. That stands for Compression Ratio Info Leak Made Easy. <laughs> That's a retronym. Compression 
ratio, info leap made easy. And I love it yeah. because what that says is that this is a classic side channel attack. They've come up with a way, and it's not public yet. They're, in, they're, they're putting their paper out today, tomorrow, and Friday. That is September 19, 20, and 21 um, at, at this year's um, uh, Echo Party in Argentina. Um, they said that the, the new attack works much like the beast attack. Once they have a man-in-the-middle position on a given network, meaning that they're, they're in line in the communications path, they are able to sniff HTTPS traffic and launch the attack. Um, they, they, their current implementation requires JavaScript running in the, in, in the browser. Uh, Rizzo was quoted uh, Giuliano was quoted saying, by running JavaScript code in the browser of the victim and sniffing HTTPS traffic, we can decrypt session cookies. Now, we all know what that means because session cookies are the way persistent authentication is created in browser client sessions. So that allows impersonation. That's much what, like what FireSheep was doing with, with Firefox some time ago. So we can decrypt session cookies. We don't need to use any browser plugin, and we use JavaScript to make the attack faster. But in theory, we could do it with stack HTML. Rizzo also said that both Mozilla Firefox and Google Chrome are vulnerable to the attack. However, the browser vendors have developed patches for the problem that will be released in the next few weeks. Now, I saw elsewhere in researching this that browser vendors have stated they're no longer vulnerable. So I don't know who's right, but any browsers that support either TLS compression, which is a standard, or Google's Speedy. Speedy, of course, offers compression as well. Basically, what these guys are doing, this is, you know, we've talked about side channel attacks on crypto. The idea is by, by changing the data being sent or sending their own with and without compression, the, con the, the content is leaked by the amount of compression it gets. So, we, for example, we know for, that, that completely random data won't compress much or, or at all. Theory, you know, hot, pure entropy, absolutely random data. There's no pattern that a compressor can use in order to represent the same thing more densely. On the other side, a string of 10 A's takes up a lot of space unless you, you encode it as there will be 10 A's following, in which case it, takes, it, it, it compresses extremely well. So the point is the ratio that you get of compression is, is set by the contents. So by, by tweaking the contents, it must be that these guys are looking at the difference in compression and then reverse engineering what the unknown data is by subtracting out what is known. So a very clever attack. Uh, I'm guessing about most of this, but that must be if if they're calling compression ratio info leak made easy. That's what it would have to ha have to be. Now, um, you need TLS compression or Speedy in in this HTTPS link. So that would require support at each end. Um, both are still relatively rare. Um, some guy said, I read, my calculator doesn't have enough zeros to the right of the decimal point for me to tell you what percentage of traffic on the Internet is subject to this attack at the moment. Meaning, you know, it's, it's too far nothing. off to the right. Yeah, zero. Nothing. So not a big problem, nothing to worry about. If anyone is worried and you're a Firefox user, you can disable Speedy 
by going by, by by putting about colon config in the URL address and then hitting enter. That brings up the massive c configuration settings for Firefox. And then in the search bar, put in SPDY, and that'll give you a nice little block of settings. And I found mine said speedy uh, network.http.speedy.enabled equals false. And dot enable dot v two is false, and dot enable dot v three is false. So I had mine all turned off. Um, I don't remember why. I think because there were some concerns you were worried probably about you it were, earlier. You yes. talked to Mark Rusinovich, maybe. Yeah. So um, anyway, this will will I will probably have confirmation that this is the problem. It doesn't sound like a bad attack. I will try to determine what's going on here between one story that says. The browser vendors will soon have this fixed, and then others that say they already have had it fixed. My Firefox hasn't updated recently. I'm 15.0.1, which is probably current. So maybe that had it fixed, or maybe that's why I've got Speedy turned off. Maybe that's what the point, the 0 0.1 was, because mine was all off. Hmm. Um, so maybe other people will find that too. We'll, we will see. Um, and I don't know how you fix this. Maybe you pad... The, you pad the the compression with pseudo random data so that it's not deterministic. That would block this. Um, anyway, we'll we'll see what they suggest. Um, but again, this is a very clever hack using using the fact that different data compresses by a different amount to reverse engineer the unknown portion from what is known, which must be what they've done. And finally. Before we get into a quick little bit of miscellany, our old friend John Graham Cumming was in the news with his most recent blog post, uh, blog.jgc.org. Our listeners will remember that we had John on uh, about his neat techie book of, uh, you know, interesting, wacky tech locations scattered around the globe Uh uh, and John has been a participant over in GRC's news groups for years. Um, and what happened was um, there's been news. I haven't been talking about it a lot because it's sort of always in the background of the depletion of the IPv4 address space. I One of the Twitter feeds I monitor uh, is, is a big – unfortunately, it shows a big uh, atomic – uh, bomb uh, mushroom cloud glowing red to to remind us that we're running out of IPv4 space. And there was a, a recent announcement that in Europe, like the last one was gone. Um, they were down, I think it was that RIPE was down to one final network. And rather than giving people huge allocations, they were now giving them a thousand of like out of the 16 million IP V4s in this remaining slash eight network. Um, so being very, very stingy about them. And John somehow said, uh, you know, what about 51.0.0.0 slash eight? You know, that whole the 51 dot network. Um, What's going on there? Who owns it's that, uh, Steve? It's registered, yeah, <laughs> it's registered to the UK Government Department for Work and Pensions. I saw this. <laughs> and, you know... How many addresses is that, Steve? <laughs> that's 16 plus million addresses. <laughs> and they're not... They're not it, it is, they say it's in use... Mm. But it's not public. So mm. they're using it like a 10-dot network. Mm -hmm. They're using it Internally. as their own privately routed, non-public sort of LAN in the same way other large organizations use 10-dot. It's exactly the same as a 10-dot. You know, I mean, I chose to use 10-dot for myself, although I hardly need 16 million IPs. And they're saying, well, we like, we want to keep it. Oh. And so... <laughs> no. I mean, they, they can't. It's like, it's wrong. They're saying, well, 80% of it is in use. Oh, Just okay. replace it with a router. Well, Sorry. all they have to do <laughs> is change the 51 to 10. Yeah. That's all they have to do. You know, I mean, yes, many times 
Yeah. But still, the, it is a publicly routable block that is not being publicly routed. Well, you know, John... Uh, as Unless we it's like about it some before, sort of spy agency or something, right? He, uh, well, he, he launched... Remember that he launched the petition to get Turing's right. reputation... Like fixed and won. because he got an apology from the prime yes, minister. Yes, yeah. yes, a formal apology over the way they had been treating Alan Turing posthumously. Obviously, well, he's launched another one. Good. There is now a petition in the works to bring to bring to bring to light and to bring bring pressure on. I'm sure the, you know he's not real popular with them right now. To being <laughs> to bring pressure on this department for work and pensions. Uh, to give up their 51 dot uh, huge. I mean, this, okay, that's one, that, that's more than one 256th of the entire internet. <laughs> Wait, so is it 20, 16 million or is it more? It's, it's going to be, it's going to be two to the 24. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, that's more than 16 million. That's yeah. um, two to, I think I was doing, well, that's no. That's trillions, isn't it? Two, no, no, two to the 24. Okay, here's a little math. Oh, yeah, I was right. 16 million. 16 but still, million. Yeah. Um, um, so that's a huge block, and they can't keep it because it is, it is not it. a private. Yes, we need it. And it's not, well, I mean. And they don't need it. Becomes, as soon as it, be, exactly. They're not using the, the public routability of it. They're using it like a private network, their own little private network. All they have to do is change all of those 51s to a 10, and everybody will be happy. It'll well, be a little messy. It'll be a little messy. But that's all right. I wonder so if I there are other blocks like that out there. Do you think? Do we know? Uh, is that just, that's just such an egregious example. I know example. that HP had, like, had 14 and 15 re even recently. Yeah. And um, you no, know, but maybe they can make a convincing case for you know they're using it. Um, so I just wanted to make a little in miscellaneous category: uh, the revolution, uh, the new J.J. Uh, Abrams uh, future power outage global, uh, you know, <laughs> sci-fi series started on Monday. And the jury's out in my case, in my instance. I read a couple very negative reviews. I'm less negative about it. Oh, we'll, we'll see how it turns out. It's too early to say. Um, I like the premise. Uh, I, I love dystopian future. The world is, you know. Yeah. Um, the acting seems fine. The people are, are interesting. We, the, we were teased at the very end. I mean, there is a definite, okay, what is it's going on? kind of Hunger games -y in the plot, it seems to me, but. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. If somebody somebody <laughs> said, hey, that, that Hunger Games movie, that, that's real big. What, what can we do that's like that? What do we got in the bin? Yeah. You know? Hey, JJ. Can hey, JJ. Work? Can you crank something out? Yeah. Yeah. And lastly, uh, I, for anyone who is interested in um, what we've been talking about recently in uh, multi-factor authentication for their own websites, I ran across an implementation of Google Authenticator written in HTML what? on on GitHub. Yes. Wow. So JavaScript or HTML? Uh must be JavaScript. Don't know what it's in at that end, but probably if you google HTML5-google-authenticator or maybe not even put the dashes and it is at 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 GitHub, you'll find it. And I just thought it it looked it looked nice. And so anyone who's interested in, you know, dropping that into their own website to allow for, you know, Google Authenticator compatible wow. uh, authentication. That's uh, awesome. It, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot of that. But uh, I just wanted to uh, point our listeners at it. That's neat. Yeah. That's it? That's it for That's today. That's all she wrote? That's it for today. That's All our news. Wrote. And when we, we had Mark and uh, we great. will do Q&A next week. So by all means, uh, if you got any questions, grc.com slash feedback. If you're just tuning in late, go back and listen to the beginning of the uh, conversation. And Mark will be back uh, for Windows <laughs> Weekly tomorrow, which is a coincidence. But I have a feeling we'll talk more about Windows. I don't know. Maybe we'll talk about the books. I don't know. 
don't know. And, I, and I'm jealous he's going to have a good microphone for that pop. For, yeah. For Paul's pop. Yeah. Thanks, Lou. <laughs> Lou's running it over <laughs> from the other side of the campus. Steve is at GRC.com. That's where he uh, keeps Spinrite. He hides it there. The world's finest hard drive maintenance and a recovery utility. Hey, the Ford Motor Company has 19.0.0.0 stroke eight. According to Consider It. Wow. I, I wonder about these companies that have such massive, I mean. Well, they have a lot of employees and they're all over the world. But do yeah. they need it publicly routable is the question. Yeah, exactly. And once upon a time, it was easy to do. I mean, we're going we're gonna to go through a period of, of you know, anxiety. The, 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 the rebuttal, not surprisingly, from the U.K. group, this, this U.K. government department for work and pensions, their rebuttal was, hey, IPv6. That's what it's for. Right. Go use that. Yeah. Well, they're and, right. And I mean, so, we, we need to move. Yeah. Sooner or later, we won't but have But we don't need choice. them to kick us in the butt to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, come on, guys. <laughs> and, and then the question is, you know, the, in, order for, in order for an organization like HP or Ford to give up their IPs, you're, first of all, Leo, you are 100% right. They do not need publicly routable IPs. I mean, really, only servers need publicly routable IPs. Yeah. Everybody, you know, everybody else um, can can come out of a smaller pool of, of natted IPs, which is, for example, what ISPs are doing now, which is what we all do in our home networks. You know, we've got one IP publicly and a bazillion inside our homes. So that that scales in a in a hierarchy beautifully. Now, of course, there are you know internet diehards that are. I hope that hopefully they're not dead yet. I was going to say turning over <laughs> their graves to hear me, but you know they're like moaning because they, they, they bemoan the whole notion of NAT. They, the original purest concept was one IP per machine, and every machine will be accessible by every other. Yeah, well, that was before firewalls. And before, you know, nation state supported crime rings of of very, very good hackers uh, began to happen. But my point was, if a company did want to give up some of their excess space, what they would need to do would be to move their allocation all sort of compress it to one end of their network block. Essentially, you know, they would, for example, if, if Ford was, was it 17? Um, I don't yeah, remember I don't what remember. number it was. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I know that HP, for example, has 14 and 15. Um, if, if you took, or like, or say, say, say the UK Department of Work, for Work and Pensions, they've got 51.000, okay? They, there's no way... They have 60, they need 16 million IPs. They couldn't have 16 million machines in the Department for Work and Pensions, no matter how bloated their, their bureaucracy is. So all they would have to do would be to, to move those, if they didn't want to switch to, dot, to, to, to 10 dot, move them all to one end. So that right now, for example, there might be 51 dot, and then rather than zero, they might be using zero and one and two and just sort of you know have come up with a very oh look we've got 60 million ips we'll use 51.1 for this location 51.2 for this location 51.3 for that location and and the idea being that if they if they squeeze that down so they're only using for example zero then they could that would free up 51.1 through 255 and they could they could keep their little 51.0 network which is a small fraction of the total 51. Dot slash you know class A network they would essentially have a class B network and that would that would you know be a compromise that would free up the bulk of their allocation and of course that scales they might have you know dot one dot two fifty one dot one dot two and dot three but be able to cram all of their allocation down into into like three class b networks and then again make you know release 
their allocation for for the balance. So I think we're going to see some back and forth and some tension as people resist the move to IPv4 just because, you know, it's not easy. It, re- it does require equipment and firmware and, and routing upgrades and so forth. General Electric has 3.0.0.0 slash 8. Yeah. <laughs> IBM yeah, and- uses 9.0.0.0 slash 8 for eternal IP, supposedly. <laughs> oh. So there's, you know, there's a few out there. Yeah, well, but once upon a time, Leo, four billion. Yeah. We're never going to use four we'll billion. We'll never use all those. Yeah. No siree. Steve Gibson is at GRC.com. That's where SpinRight is. And, of course, uh, your chance to ask questions for next week's episode, GRC.com slash feedback, stroke eight. No, no stroke eight. Uh, he also has lots of uh, free stuff there, including SpinRight, the world's Oh, I said that. Oh, Shields Up. Shoot the Messenger. Decombobulator. All those other free things. Password Haystacks. And all of that stuff. GRC.com and 16 kilobit versions of this show in audio for the bandwidth impaired. Text versions, transcriptions by the great Elaine. We have the video and the high quality audio at over at our site, twit.tv slash SN. But you're still putting show notes at security at your, your site, right, Steve? GRC.com? I have not been doing show oh, okay. notes okay. For, so, for a long time. We'll get our wiki guy on it. We'll get that him up to great. date. Yeah, because we're a few yeah, months and behind. The, uh, the, the transcripts that we have really come in handy because as I was reading about this, the, the new crime attack, the compression ratio info leak made easy, right. I thought, Giuliano Rizzo, wasn't, he on, beach? wasn't he on the beach Somewhere <laughs> developing and, the and uh, the nice thing is it's text speech? search right that's the yeah so I it. yeah I went to our I went to grc dot com slash sn which bounced me to slash security now dot htm I put uh, I think I might have put beach into um, the search box and up and came and oh no I think I I think I put Rizzo in because I knew his name and sure enough there were three hits on that and that's one awesome. took me to Elaine's transcript from the time. We were talking about um, the beast attack. So Fantastic. it's easy to find those things here. All right. We're going to uh, sign off. Uh, coming up this week in Google, Jeff Jarvis in studio with us. We will uh, see you uh, next Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Yep. For a Q&A. For a Q&A. Steve Gibson. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Leo. See you next time on Security Now. Security Now.